50. Psalms 50. I was reading a while back, and I've walked around in it a couple times since. Psalms 50, beginning to read with verse 1, The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken, and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. But the verse in this chapter that caught my attention some time ago, and I share it with you this evening, is part of uh, verse 12. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. That got my attention some time ago. And I thought, who, who would say that? You know, have, have you ever really gotten hungry? I mean, have you really gotten hungry for something particular? Maybe you never get hit with something like that. I get hit with something like that every once in a while. I know people that get hit with something like that every day. <laughs> it shows. Oh, I shouldn't say that this early in the meeting, but... It's beginning to with me, but uh, you ever get a craving? You ever get an appetite for something? I mean, not because you're expecting. I can remember back as a young, uh, when Rachel and I first got married, and she was expecting, and she'd get cravings for things. And they laid it to, you know, to the pregnancy. I'm not going to get out of that over much tonight. Some of you are looking world, uh, worried to begin. But, you know, out of the clear blue, I mean, in the wee hours of the night, she'd say, I want a pickle. <laughs> say, what? I want a pickle. Oh. I thought it was a woman thing. And I still think it is. But... What, what do you develop an appetite for? What, what do you crave? Now let's switch gears a little bit, but I mean with God. What, what do you have a craving for? With the Lord, what, what would whet your appetite? First song we sang in this meeting, that Brother Jeff, fill my cup, Lord. I was reading that, and I don't have it before me, but my, the words in that talks about feeding us. And, and, and evidence to me that the songwriter realized you and I do, in fact, have appetite, don't we? Unless something ails us, or... I mean, I know it can change over the years, and sometimes it changes because we lose our teeth. 
So we have to develop a different appetite. But when it comes to Lord, we want revival. What what whets your appetite? And have you ever been hungry for something, but it, you, you couldn't get it? Really hungry for something, but you couldn't get it. Maybe it was out of season. Some stuff is only seasonal. Maybe it was the price that it would cost to put it on your table. It just was out of reach. A lot of things I thought about when I first read this, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. And I thought to myself, who... Who is, who is saying that? But when you begin to read, you realize that God made that statement. He made that statement to Asaph. My Bible says it's a psalm of Asaph. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. And I thought about that, Lord, you're not, you're not boasting. You're not playing games with Asaph. You're not taunting Asaph. You're simply wanting Asaph to know something based on one of the most natural things that a person can understand, and that's appetite. Whether it's simply appetite of an evening for an apple, or once in a while a craving. I was just out in Ohio, and I, I went to a, to a Mennonite Amish um, restaurant out there, Der Dutchman. They have one in in Sarasota, Florida, when we're in in Florida. Der Dutchman. And it is what it sounds like. It's a Pennsylvania, well, no, it's not. It's an Ohio Dutch, Holmes County. But we went there, Rachel and I, for breakfast, and I wanted scrapple. And they didn't have any. The little girl waiting on me didn't have any clue what it was. I said, Der Dutchman. And you don't know what Scrapple is? That's like a person from England not knowing what tea is. And we reminded them, you know, way back when we dumped it in the harbor. But when God said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell thee. Because God wants Asaph, and therefore God wants us to know that he is the mighty God here in verse 1. The mighty God. I know that's elementary, but... If we're going to have revival, we want the mighty God to step on location. Oh, God, walk in our midst. Walk in our midst. Look us over, Lord. It's not the business of the evangelist or the singer to evaluate the people, although you can't help once in a while looking back at you and wondering, What is going on in their head right now? (laughs) But Lord, you must walk in our midst and never does he step into a congregation or into a sanctuary 
at a loss for anyone that he finds there. Never is he in a quandary because of your complex. Coincidental, though, if I just point at you upon making a point. But God understands you entirely. God knows you completely. He knows what you are, who you are, where you've been and what you've done. He has your track record and your resume. But Lord, that's why we delight in asking you to come. Asking you to fill our cup. Asking you to pour out of your blessing. Because you know what we need. And you are almighty God. And you have the supply. And there is no shortage. You don't have to ship it in. You are the mighty God. Even the Lord. And, and in the first verse of this, you have spoken. I know this seems overly simplistic, but I want to tell you, did it ever, do you ever wonder at the fact that, oh God, almighty God, and you'll speak to me. Does he speak to you? Has God come and, and talked to you? Do you realize how precious, do you realize, realize how special you must be that God will come and talk to you? Even, even hear me tonight, the first night of revival, even if God somewhere along the line speaks to us in convicting power. It's still something that the mighty God would come and speak to us. He must think a lot of us that he doesn't just let us go on our way and make our bed one day in hell. He must care a lot for you that he would trouble the water of your heart and say you ought not to be doing that or you ought to be doing this or whatever the Holy Ghost deals with us about. And oh, the mighty God come in our midst. We're a privileged people as a congregation, but how privileged are we as an individual if God the Holy Ghost comes? I mean, if he comes and slips into the row that I'm sitting in, and knowing me all together, knowing the little secrets, and he deals with me because he cares. God knows our appetites. God knows when we get hungry. And you know what? God made us that we just repeatedly, over and over and over again, get hungry. You can be entertained by the Walters, which I am. You're with relatives. I know how that could be with relatives. <laughs> Although your relatives might not be entirely like mine. <laughs> but I'm with the Walters. And when you're with the Walters, there are delicacies. There are little 
things set up in preparation for the evangelist. I'm telling you, I went into my room. You ought to see the bed that I'm supposed to sleep on tonight. I'm going to be wore out taking pillows off from it. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. I took a picture of it because there's no way I'll ever be able to get those pillows back on in the order that they're in. I told my wife, I sent the picture to her. I said, what do I do, hon? I said, you get down here. I don't know how to handle this. She told me before the service, she told me, I shouldn't share these secrets, but she told me before the service that when she sits down, she gets tired and goes to sleep. Well, it's no wonder she's worked so hard. There must be four, eight, there must be 16 pillows on my bed. Oh. But you know your pastor, and you know your pastor's wife, she does things right, and hospitality is their middle name, and I mean, over in the one corner there was a little mood light. I need a mood light. <laughs> There's a little basket, and she's got it spilled, and spilling out of it's all kinds of chocolate. Isn't that good for an, a diabetic evangelist? <laughs> I'm going to be so high, I'll be bouncing off the walls. <laughs> and, and she told me, when you, if, if that's not enough, when you eat them up, let me know and I'll bring some more. So I think those will last tonight. I'll probably 10 o'clock tomorrow, I'll need some more. <laughs> over and over and over again, we get hungry. But just out of the clear, and it's recorded in Holy Writ, God said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't have to tell you. And we begin to read this psalm, and he begins to tell us, he is God, he's the mighty God, even the Lord. He has spoken and he has called. Oh, God, do it. Do it in this revival. Please, please speak and please call. And the call of God is more than a call into ministry or, or a call into missions. And it can include that. But oh, the call, the call to a, to a sinner. Come on. Come on, you don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to be that way. God, the Holy Ghost, always, always when he calls, when he speaks, it's a better things than we ever had in sin. Always, he's bringing us out to bring us in to better things. No regrets to anybody that ever says, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Isaiah looked, remember, and he said that they walked in darkness and they've seen a great light. And when Jesus came and Matthew I believe chapter 4, it said, They that sat in darkness have seen a great light. Christ had come. And when Christ comes, the light shines. And in this psalm, he said, Out of Zion, verse 2, God hath shined. God hath shined. Oh, God, come in your power. Come in your glory. Come where there is darkness. Come where we are bound in our habits and in our sin. And shine the light, the glorious light of the gospel upon us. God has shined. Hallelujah. Even 
he said, thy God, in verse 11. I believe it is. Now, no, it's not verse 11. I don't know where I got that. If you, if you could see my notes. I have, one guy asked me, do you ever have notes? I said, yeah, I have notes. I just can't read them. Thank you. <laughs> Could I have a little more help, please? <laughs> I love it. I do. I really do love it. Oh, yeah. Will somebody wake Anita Walder up, please? But, but don't do it harshly. Do it lovingly. Therefore, Alan, pardon me, Brother Walder. Be better you do it. That's the other thing in the room she put me. There's a big sign. It says, kiss me in the morning. You know, that, that, that makes alarm bells go off. <laughs> and then the one below it says, and kiss me again in the evening. <laughs> I asked him, I said, who does that apply to? <laughs> you know? Anyway, this is where I'm living for a week. <laughs> I told my wife, I said, honey, get down here. Get down here, I need you. Anyway, where are we? God has spoken. God doesn't need our help. God isn't dependent on us. But he does speak to us. And we need you to, Lord. He speaks to us in verse 14. He said, offer unto God thanksgiving. Wonder what would happen. I enjoyed the testimonies tonight. But I wonder what would happen if we become as thankful as it seems to me God wants us to be. I mean, if we absolutely work at it to be grateful and thankful to God for taking for granted things, for difficult things, for things that we haven't always understood, for things we can't change. If I develop, Lord, a thankful spirit, I'm not just all plus, 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 but God said in this psalm, he said, offer unto God thanksgiving. Pay thy vows. I believe here's a simple little recipe for revival. Come to God with thanksgiving. Really, if you practice thanksgiving, it, it develops into excitement, expectation, anticipation, gratitude to God. Takes away our grumbling and our moaning and our griping, our complaining. Helps to keep us from getting depressed. And it's hard for me to talk about that because I've told you, I've told congregations everywhere, it's in my DNA to be partially depressed. I'm my dad's boy. I see the cup half empty, not half full. I can look at a cloudy day like today and think in depressing terms. But, but I know it. I know I'm depressed. So, I read a psalm like this and it says, be thankful. And so I am. I'm thankful I'm depressed. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not thankful I'm depressed, but I'm, th I'm thankful. He said, pay thy vows. You know, you know how simple both of these commandments are, or these things that God's speaking about here is? Do you realize how you can do that? 
Everybody that ever comes to Jesus makes promises. That's between you and God, none of my business. But everybody that comes to Jesus said, Lord, I'll do this or I'll not do that. And, and, and God honors that commitment and, and, and forgives us our sins and saves us or later on sanctifies us holy. God does these things, but everybody makes promises to God. He's simply saying, keep your word. Be grateful and keep your word. Don't make it more difficult than what God makes it. You want to walk with him. You want to sit at his table. You want to be fed of the Lord. And we sing about Jesus has a table spread. He doesn't have to be entertained. He has a vast supply. He is, he, he, it never gets threadbare. It never runs out. I've always thought, if Jesus has a table spread, ought we not to sit up to it? Ought we not to partake of it? And if Jesus gives it to us, we know that it's, no, it's more banana splits than broccoli. <laughs> At least that's my warped theory on that. I don't know what Adam Clark would say. <laughs> I've always thought if Jesus has a table spread, we ought to sit up and eat. We ought to eat. And because we sit up and eat, we ought to be fat. Every one of you ought to be fat. And flourishing. I always think that's a shouting point for some people, but I never get anywhere with it. All right, we ought to be skinny. We ought to be pining away. We ought to be withering up. We ought to be an old piece of beef jerky. And when people ask, we say, I'm sitting at the table of the Lord eating all the good things he gives me, and look at me. No, we ought to be fat and flourishing. We ought to be satisfied entirely. Praise God. Well, we got to proceed so we can get done. Yep, she's still awake. Good deal. Okay, what else? What else here? Speaking to us. Offer thanksgiving, pay thy vows, and in verse 15, in the day of trouble, call upon me and I will deliver. God will keep his word. He'll be to us what we need him to be. And then just tonight, kind of in closing, uh, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. But he does say to us, he said, I don't need it, but he said, offer unto me your thanksgiving. Pay your vows. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I'll deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked, now get this. Unto the wicked, God saith. And he goes on down to say, he says, you hate instruction. Verse 17. The wicked hates instruction. The wicked doesn't want anybody to tell him what to do, including his pastor, including the evangelist. Wicked doesn't want to take any instruction. Here God says, you hate instruction. You cast my words behind your back. You won't take what the Holy Ghost speaks to you about. You put it behind your back. And you and I know that God leads us like a shepherd. He doesn't drive us. He doesn't want to be back somewhere behind you, uh, talking to you, driving you with his words. He wants to be ahead of you and, and saying, come to me, follow me. I'll make you. I'll lead you. I'll be to you what you need me to be. But he said here, the wicked hates instruction, cast my words behind him. Look at this one. If this doesn't hit home today, in verse 18, when, this is hard for me to read, there's some 
difficult words in the King James in this for me to pronounce. I don't know why, but when thou sawest a thief, when you see a thief, then thou consentedest, that's a hard word for me to say. It means that you okay it. You consentedest with him. I want to tell you something. I saw a little clip, maybe you don't believe in it, but bear with me this much. On my phone, I saw a news clip in one of our prominent cities of rioters breaking in to a high-end store, Macy's or something, if that's high-end, Walmart, <laughs> Dollar General, Anyway, breaking into a store, and they filmed them coming out with both arms full of unpaid-for merchandise. When thou seest a thief, thou consentest. We had a senator, according to the news, say they couldn't afford that, therefore they have a right to get it. I told Rachel, I said, honey, get ready. Pack the car. We're going to Cabela's. There's a lot of stuff there I can't afford, but I'm going to fill the car. You watch a thief and you okay it. Got to close here. Remember, you hate instruction. You cast my words behind your back. You consent with a thief. You've been partakers with adulterers, immoral living. You don't get along with your own family like the Strattons get along with theirs. I don't have any here, so I don't have to get along, except with the Walters which is going to be a job. But he said, verse 21, These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. In the same psalm where he said, God hath shined, he says, I kept silence. And thou thoughtest, because I kept silent, you thought I was altogether such a one as thyself. Verse 21. But I will reprove thee. Here we get, O oh God, to what, if we need it, we want to happen. We don't want people to think the preacher has something against them or has their number or is talked. But Lord, we want you to examine us because you're drawing it like it is. You see what the righteous need to do and you see what the wicked are doing. And so here, Lord, you said, I will reprove thee and set them, these things, in order before thine eyes. Picture the work of the Holy Ghost. Setting things in God's order so that we see it God's way. Lord, we've got we've to see it that way. If we have any hope of heaven, we've got to see it the way you see it. Not the way we've hit it, not the way we've professed it. We've got to see it, Lord, the way you see it. So set it in order that we can come to the light and the darkness doesn't cover it. We see it. And God the Holy Ghost will be orderly in dealing with a backslider or a sinner or even a Christian that needs to step up. 
And Lord, because we know you care, we'll accept it. You know, if you know somebody likes you, you can take some pretty straight preaching. In fact, sometimes they can just right out step on your toes. And if you know they really care, you can take it. Now, if, if they've never proven to you that they really care, that's different. Then you get into fisticuffs. But I want to tell you, nobody can point a finger at God or the Holy Ghost and say, you know what, you don't care. What do you mean you don't care? Look at Calvary. Right. Right. Baffles me that he even comes in our revival efforts and deliberately shows attention to us, even though it's hard on us, but it's because he cares. And if we recognize that, it can help us to break the chains of sin. Get our liberty, get our freedom. Get to know God. Because he said, I'll set it in order. And in verse 23, he said, well, he said, he said, now consider this. Ye that forget God. This is, this is pretty extreme. Lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. This is the one that said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Now he's saying to the wicked, take note. I've been silent, but I'm not silent now. I'm reproving you. I could tear you in pieces, and there'd be no champion come to deliver you. How different that is from how the devil tears us to pieces and how the devil destroys us and how the devil hurts us. There is one that's stronger than the devil that can come to our rescue. There is a champion for our soul. And here he is in the last verse and we're done. He said, whoso offereth praise. Remember what he said to the saints? Be thankful. Seems an oversimplification, but there has to be some merit to it, people. If we can get on the praise team, if we can get ourselves in our mind and heart praising God, regardless of where we're at tonight. He said here, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright, or his life, will I show the salvation of God. God said, I'll set it in order before you. And if you'll purpose to order your life by what I set in order, I'll show you the salvation of God. Hallelujah. He did that to me one time. He showed me the salvation of God. I didn't understand it all, but I chose it over everything that heretofore had been. And God gave me victory that I've never gotten over. Amen. Oh, God, come and do it again. I know I'm preaching to good people tonight, and I've been a little long on the first night. But after I deal with all those pillows, I'll be wore out. I'll, I won't be as long tomorrow night. Come back tomorrow night, okay? But listen, listen. God comes. God gets in our way. God starts rearranging things in our life and he starts setting them in order. And when we see it God's way, we've got to acquiesce and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That's the way I want it. That's what I want. Goodbye, old world, I'm through. I'm going to go God's way. And God can give us victory. Because the God that doesn't have to tell you, because he never gets hungry. This is, this, is the, this is the psalm, I think, that has it in there, that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's in there. He owns the earth in its fullness. He never gets hungry. He knows we do, though. So he comes to us. On purpose, he comes to us. 
he'll give us the salvation of God that satisfies the longing of our soul. Amen. Let's stand together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. You've been praying for revival.